Hi everyone, my name is Kayla Cervera and I'm a project engineer here at Risk Management Professionals. Today I will be continuing our ongoing Nevada CAP webinar series with a presentation on the Process Safety Information or PSI program. The focus of my webinar today will be on how to successfully implement the Nevada's Department of Environmental Protections regulations and utilize their checklists that are used for guidance during compliance audits and inspections. I will also provide helpful tips on how to utilize tables to organize PSI information, including equipment specifications, safe operating limits, and applicable codes and standards. Here's a little background of RMP. We provide a multitude of services for your process safety management and risk management program needs. This includes process hazard analyses, or PHAs, and compliance audits. We have worked extensively with specific local and state regulations related to chemical release prevention programs, including CalARP in California and CAP in Nevada. On today's agenda, we're going to look at the regulatory history of Nevada's Department of Environmental Protection, or NDEP, and some of the regulated chemicals that drive applicability, the NDEP guidance provided to ensure compliance, and then we'll dive into the specifics of the PSI program. This will include the important role that PSI plays in the Nevada CAP program, a breakdown of categories required by NDEP for compliance in the PSI program, and this includes the hazards of the substances used, equipment and technology specifications, and the system safe operating limits. There are also a couple sections where requirements overlap. We will go over those specific requirements and how to create organized tables to address them. We'll then conclude with a summary of the webinar. This slide displays all the program elements of the Nevada CAP program. In comparison to the EPA's Risk Management Plan or OSHA's Process Safety Management, most of the program elements are redundant. In most cases, this allows regulated facilities to comply with all three regulatory agencies with one program. Today, we will be focusing on PSI. All of today's topics are based off of two NDEP provided documents regarding the PSI program and are available at the link provided on the slide. The element audit checklist is used by NDEP for facility audits and can also be used to perform the triennial internal compliance audit required by Nevada CAP. The data form provides additional details regarding all the requirements listed on the checklist items. In regards to the PSI program, it provides facilities help with the compilation, organization, and evaluation of information that is required to be gathered for the PSI program. The NDEP clearly identifies the importance of a strong PSI program in regards to other Nevada CAP program elements. It specifically mentions that the Process Hazard Analysis, or PHA, the development of standard operating procedures, the ability to identify the need for a management of change, or MOC, and the development of the Mechanical Integrity Program would all be impossible without complete and accurate PSI. This diagram shows the type of PSI information that each of these programs specifically depend on. The NDEP PSI checklist breaks the program down into five different categories. Hazards of substances, which entails specific characteristics and compatibility of the regulated substances, technology of the process and equipment of the process, where details regarding equipment operating limits and design specifications are documented, safety systems and their functions, and code applicability and compliance. The best way to organize chemical information in this section is to provide a table summary in the PSI document or to reference the location of where the information sources can be located. The required information to include in the PSI program are toxicity information, permissible exposure limits, and much more as they are listed here. The main source of information identified in this requirement can be located in the Chemical Safety Data Sheet, or SDS, this will contain physical, reactivity, thermal, and chemical stability data. The NIOSH Pocket Guide to Chemical Hazards is also a great resource for chemical data. Corrosivity data relates to chemical incompatibility with materials of construction. This data can be located in Perry's Chemical Engineer's Handbook or in specific chemical handbooks created by various agencies. An example being the chlorine manual created by the Chlorine Institute. 
The necessity of corrosivity data can be shown through the example of liquid propane and aluminum, where there would be an excessive corrosion of aluminum if it was used in liquid propane service. This should be documented as not allowed to be a material of construction in the system. Lastly, the foreseeable hazardous effects of inadvertent mixing should be documented. This can be accomplished with a chemical compatibility chart, which I will show in the next slide. Chemical compatibility charts are most useful in processes where multiple chemicals are used, including solvents, utilities such as steam and nitrogen, and where the possibility of contaminants exist. An example provided is the EPA's chemical compatibility chart that identifies not only all the chemicals in question, but a code and consequence legend that expresses the type of hazard that can occur, such as a fire or heat generation. The requirements of the next section, technology of the process, can be documented in multiple ways. Process chemistry is best documented in a summary included in the PSI document. This includes a description of the process, chemical reactions that can take place during the process, and any side products and intermediates created during the reaction. This also includes the use of catalysts and if any undesirable chemical reactions can occur. These are relatively short but can depend on the complexity of the process. Maximum intended inventory can also be documented in a summary or an organized table can be created and included in the PSI documentation. The requirements of this item are to summarize storage container limits, in-process quantities, and administrative controls such as level switches. For example, the table at the bottom of the slide is for a process that is limited by the amount contained in one storage unit. The table outlines the tank tag number, the nominal tank capacity without any controls, the density of the material contained, the fill limit, which is an administrative control used to maintain at 80% in this example, and the resulting maximum intended inventory in pounds. This is a very simple example, and maximum intended inventory be can become very complex with larger systems where every piece of equipment and their volume must be considered to summate the total inventory. Additionally, diagrams are required for this section of PSI. Block flow or process flow diagrams, PFDs, that depict major equipment, equipment names, and other critical process components must be developed. PFDs can also be combined with the system materials and energy balance. This will address requirements in the next section of the PSI program. This also includes piping and instrumentation diagrams, or PNIDs. This is included in the equipment of the process section of the NDEP checklist and will be covered later in the webinar. On this slide, there is a very simple process flow diagram and material and energy balance that was provided in the NDEP PSI data form as an example. So starting with the top of the diagram, major equipment is depicted including the two pressure vessels and compressors, block valves and actuated valves are shown on process lines as well as those shown on bypass lines. Additional information that could have been included here that would have been helpful would be the tag numbers of the process equipment as well as their design limits. Otherwise, this PFD proves to be compliant with the checklist. The material energy imbalance shown below depicts stream numbers that are labeled on the PFD portion of the diagram. There is a designated stream number on every inlet and outlet of each piece of process equipment as the composition and characteristics of the substance will likely change. The balance provides process parameters such as pressure, temperature, and flow. The rest of the parameters listed here are requirements per the NDEP checklist. As discussed, there are multiple checklist items where compliance was demonstrated with some of the examples I provided. For Section 1, Hazards of Substances, we discussed the safety data sheets and provided them as a reference in the PSI documentation. Although it specifies material safety data sheets in the checklist, the Nevada Administrative Code specifies that the data sheet should be in compliance with the standards outlined in the Globally Harmonized System of Classification and Labeling of Chemicals, or GHS. We also discussed all the relevant hazard information that NDEP looks for in each hazardous substances and where to find that information. For section two, we saw an example of a process flow diagram and also went 
through the process chemistry description and what's required to be included there. We then demonstrated how to perform maximum intended inventory calculations based on a very simple storage take and included the required elements such as administrative controls in the table. Lastly, we included the heat and material balance in the PFD, which accomplished a requirement in Section 3, Equipment of the Process. This included stream pressure, temperature, and other composition information in the diagram. There's actually some overlap when looking at Sections 2 and 3 of the NDEP checklist, where the primary requirement is the documentation of process parameters. This includes the safe lower and upper limits, as well as the normal operating range. Those safe limits are based off both safe mechanical limits and safe process limits. Mechanical limits are based off of codes, standards, or the equipment vendors that apply to piping, equipment, and instruments. They are the minimum and maximum design limits that when taken into consideration, the integrity of the system will be maintained. Process limits aren't as well defined but can exist based on a specific process, such as a concentration of a reactant or the temperature of the chemical reaction. The exceedance of these limits could result in a consequence due to this deviation, such as a runaway reaction that could result in a release. A release could also be a consequence for an exceedance of a mechanical limit. To organize the information on the last slide, the development of a process of equipment and instrumentation specification table would be beneficial. In this example, we are creating a table with parameters specific to pumps. At a minimum, however, all tables for equipment and instrumentation should include the following. A list of all equipment, piping, and instrumentation, materials of construction for each process component, maximum and minimum design parameters for all applicable variables, and lastly, other equipment design variables that could result in an impact on the rest of the process. Our example here fulfills all these aspects while also addressing the last item, other equipment design parameters. For pumps, the maximum differential pressure is an important parameter when determining the maximum pressure that can occur within the discharge piping of the pump when flow is lost. The materials of construction and design codes are identified and evaluated to determine compatibility with the process. This will also help during replacements to make sure specifications are similar to the original. Lastly, referencing created documentation for each piece of equipment provides a paper trail for how this information was gathered and evaluated. Similarly, this chart should also be done for process piping and piping components such as valves. The example shows similar information to the pump, but with specific parameters that are relevant to piping, like corrosion allowance. Documentation is also referenced in this table. And since piping is something that is analyzed more methodically for the system as a whole, referencing to system piping calculations and documentation should be included as well. When all operating limits for specific equipment, piping, and instrumentation have been identified, safe limits should then be defined for specific sections of the process rather than for each individual component. In this example, we are looking at the process flow from the pump's discharge to a storage tank. Here, we are examining safe pressure operating limits. We've identified the piping spec A1 to be the upper limit for pressure at 740 PSIG and the level switch located on the storage tank to be the lower limit for pressure at 300 PSIG. The consequences of deviation should then be evaluated and documented in the table per the NDEP checklist. In this case, we are concerned with failure of piping and instrumentation that could lead to a release. This should be done for all sections of the process and for all process parameters. Here, we've documented the safe limits for process variables by determining the minimum and maximum limitations of all equipment, piping, and instrumentation in each chosen process segment. We've examined each individual process component for its design parameters and whether it's operating in between the safe limits. We've also documented all design codes and materials of construction and evaluated if it was compatible with process fluids. It is important to note that additional comprehensive documentation for process components should still be maintained and referenced since not all the information will be presented in these tables.
Lastly, we've identified the consequences of deviating outside of the process limits. This addresses items in both section two and three of the NDEP checklist. Moving along to section three, equipment of the process, piping and instrumentation diagrams or PNIDs are essential for all elements of Nevada CAP. These are one of the most referenced documents and should be correct and sufficient to ensure their successful use. This includes showing auxiliary systems and utilities, piping and valve specifications, and spec breaks. PNIDs also depict the control logic of the system with actuated valve failure positions, set points, and control loops. If it's not documented in the PNID sufficiently, other documentation for control logic should be created, such as a cause and effect matrix. These are diagrams that document all control logic, set points, and associated action with each control loop. I will show an example of both a PNID and a cause and effect matrix. Here's an example of a PNID provided in the NDEP data form. It demonstrates compliance with showing the control loop and narrative of the high level switch. The control loop shows that XC01 will initiate a shutdown of the compressor motor at the set point of 52 inches. Line specs and pipe spec brakes are displayed clearly as well as equipment design specs for maximum allowable working temperature and pressure. Lastly, we see a drain valve on the level indicator that is labeled as normally closed during operation. Here is an example of a cause and effect matrix that displays the exact control loop information on the PNID for the high level switch, but in a tabulated form. This is typically used when there are multiple control loops in the system with high and low switch set points that initiate different corrective actions. I've included the high pressure alarm that was not depicted in the PNID, but this gives another example of what can be included here, where this would only trigger a control room alarm and not the trip of the compressor motor like LSH01 does. Electrical classification of the process areas per Article 500 of the National Electric Code is required per the NDEP checklist. The creation of an electrical area drawing can prove to be efficient as it will simplify a situation where there are multiple area classifications in one area and equipment, control rooms, and other buildings can be included in the drawing to demonstrate their electrical classification. Once this drawing is created, the evaluation and documentation of the compatibility of the equipment and buildings with their electrical area classification can then be completed. This information can be found in equipment and building code documentation for electrical ratings. Pressure relief devices or PRDs are one of the most commonly used safety systems for overpressure protection. As such, the table below can be used to satisfy NDEP checklist requirements regarding their documentation. First, the reference to the documentation where sizing calculations were performed and the requirements of the PSV capacity were documented should be included. This table provides a summary of the results of the calculations, including the sizing basis for which the calculation was performed. Examples can include thermal or external fire relief or a process upset. In this example, a blocked outlet scenario was examined. The actual nameplate specifications of the PRD should also be documented, as this will show that it is adequately sized for the sizing basis. Lastly, pressure relief and headers and associated flares should be evaluated and determined to be adequate for the capacity for this relief scenario. It would also be productive to reference the design specification and calculations performed for the pressure relief headers and flare to provide a basis for this assessment. Ventilation system design requirements are based on the Uniform Fire Code Article 80, or there may be specific NFPA requirements based on the process, like NFPA 58 for propane systems. Capacity calculations should be documented using the areas of electrical classification or other identified hazard areas. The chosen ventilation system and its available capacity should be documented based on manufacturer specifications and there should be included in the documentation an evaluation of whether the system configuration is adequate. 
a table can be added with comparison of actual requirements and design capabilities, similar to the pressure relief device table. Scrubber capacities connected to the ventilation system should also be documented as applicable. The NDEP checklist requires the creation of a safety system description where all safety systems and their functions, including set points and associated actions, are documented within PSI documentation. All of the systems here are to be documented as applicable. The last section, Code and Applicability and Compliance, was addressed in the Process Equipment and Instrumentation Specifications tables and as shown in this slide. The applicable codes and specifications were defined and evaluation of compliance and compatibility of the process were also confirmed. However, a reference table with a summary of codes and standards used for design, installation, and operation would provide organization to the numerous codes that can be applicable to a process. This should also include applicable building codes where the process is located. In conclusion, the NDEP has provided very helpful guidance documentation for the creation of your facility's PSI program and associated documentation. It includes these major points to keep in mind. Complete and accurate PSI program ensures success of other programs. Organization of PSI in tables and charts proves efficient and compliant. Inclusion of documentation references in the PSI program keeps the program succinct. And NDEP PSI checklists and data forms are the best source of required information and documentation. Thanks for joining today's webinar. If you have any questions or would like more information about RMP, feel free to reach out. Again, my name is Kayla and you can find all my contact information below.